so far. It's so incredible. It's broke to a little toy. So. Praise God. But even at, out of the mouth of babes, yeah? yeah. Shabbat Shalom. Every morning, the first thing you say, Shabbat Shalom. Yeah. Thank you, <laughs> so today we're gonna be today we're gonna be looking at paragraph seventy in our continued um, trek through the life of Messiah from a Jewish perspective. And as we look at things, uh, let us uh, bless our Torah as we go forward. Baruch Hu et Adonai HaMevorah Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melet HaOlam Asher Bakarbanu Miko HaAmim Venatan Danu et Torato Baruch Ata Adonai Noten HaTorah Noten HaBrit HaDashah no ten Yeshua. Abba, we thank you that you have uh, retained all your truth, Lord, in the word that you have sent forth from many years ago until today, Lord. You said not one yod, not one tittle shall pass, Lord. And your promises are true and amen. And we can glean from it even today. And we can find strength and restoration healing and hope in your word. So we thank you so much for your faithfulness towards your people. In Yeshua's name we pray and we all say, Amen. Amen. Okay. So we're still going through the life of Messiah and Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum has made a life work and it's one of the greatest works out there as far as uh, biblical studies from a Jewish perspective. So chapter, uh, paragraph 70, we're going to look at today, is the witness in view of rejection. So he just was rejected in paragraph 61 through 64, and we're going to see what is Yeshua's reaction in light of this rejection from the religious leaders of his day. Would he cower and hide, or would he be bold and come forward? So as you can see, we, we take the gospel side by side as they... Um, coincide. As you can see, Matthew's account is very detailed. So we're going to look through this in seven um, sections because it's pretty long and pretty intense. But we're going to see how Yeshua will be sending out the 12 on this preaching tour. So what this section will bring for us who study God's Word is clarity. Clarity meaning what we have already learned from our Western perspective or mainline churches. And we're going to see what is really true in light of the Jewish insights that Dr. Frutenbaum has offered. So point one in the text is the introduction. Shelly, can you? Uh, Carly. Carly, sorry. So point one we're going to look at is the introduction. And in verse 35, Yeshua will reiterate what he has been already been doing throughout this time on earth. It says in verse 35, And Yeshua went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. So we see a threefold ministry. First, he went out to all the cities and villages. And the places that he went were the synagogues. So he went from cities, and within these cities, he went from synagogue to synagogue. So he went there teaching. Now remember, where does the synagogues derive from? Where did the synagogues begin? Anybody remember? Babylon. The synagogues began with the oral traditions of men when God was silent. The Jewish men were not. They were developing the Mishnah, this oral tradition that had been passed on and had been in use even till today. So the synagogues, the Pharisees, and Sadducees were all developed to the intertestamental times when Yehovah was silent. 
the men were making these, deriving these things. So these things were not ordained by Yehovah. So if you go from the Tanakh, the Old Testament, you, know, you never read anything about a synagogue, a Pharisee, or a Sadducee. Then all of a sudden you come to the new writings and boom, you see Pharisees, Sadducees, synagogues. This was all developed during the time of the Mishnah. So this, the synagogues, was all Mishnah uh, approved, I guess, developed by the Jewish men. So Catholic doctrine teaches that the Jews were to blame for killing of the Messiah, Yeshua. So now they believe that they have been given the authority by Adonai and has replaced the Jewish um, belief. They call that replacement theology. But the Catholic Church, they too have developed their own man-made dogmas and traditions. So that's all to speak about the synagogues. The second thing was the content. And it says they went out preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Now in the next section, we're going to dive deep into what kingdom is he talking about? Are you able to understand what kingdom he is talking about? And the next thing that he says up there is the authentication that they are truly God's followers is He'll give them the power of healing. Every sickness, every disease among the people. Some may ask that as they're going out into sending them out into the ministry, we're going to see that Yeshua sends them out into the ministry. Someone asked, would that be a contradiction to the unpardonable sin? So we went through the unpardonable sin, and the unpardonable sin is the rejection of Jesus the Messiah while he was still on earth by the religious leaders of Israel that day claiming that his works were done not by the Holy Spirit but by a demonic spirit by Elzebub. So we're going to see that this is not a contradiction to what we have discussed earlier about the change in his ministry. But here he's going to focus not on the multitudes but here he's going to focus on individuals not on the multitudes. So we're going to see they're going to be going house to house, individual homes, two by two, and not to the multitudes. So in verse 36, it says, When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and scattered abroad as the sheep, having no shepherd. So this is a time of confusion in the land of Israel. They all saw Yeshua's works and they thought that had to be the Messiah that the rabbis had been teaching us about, but the rabbis themselves had rejected him. So the religious leaders, the rabbis, the leadership of them, they have already rejected Yeshua officially. But there are many, many individual people who are still quite uncertain who to follow. Shall we follow Yeshua? or the religious leaders. They're in a dilemma here. So Yeshua has compassion on the multitudes because within the multitudes is the true Israel of God, the true believers in the Messiah. So this particular preaching tour is needed and necessary to reach the remnant that will believe and are amongst the masses. So verse 37 and 38 says, Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore that the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. So what principle do we have here? It's like those who pray for laborers should also at some point be willing to become laborers themselves. And those who pray for the harvest can also at times reap the harvest. So we shouldn't limit or uh, pigeonhole ourselves to just one work only, but be open at times to do another work as Adonai leads. So not just praying for physical workers to go out in the field, 
But at times we ourselves becoming that physical worker too. And the one who prays also sows the seed of the gospel. So likewise, not just praying for the harvest, but getting out there and reaping some of the harvest. So how do you reap the harvest? You go out there and you connect with people. Connecting with people is vital to the harvest because Yeshua, that's exactly how he did it. He's the perfect example for us versus social distancing. <laughs> social distancing by just praying. Just praying is, uh, don't get me wrong, praying is to me firing the winning shot. But what sometimes prayer can be and become is an excuse for inactivity, an excuse for non-involvement. So you could see an unbeliever walking on the street or you know a non-believer, and you know that he has a problem, whether financial, marital, or addicted to something. And so you pray for him, but, but you don't go beyond that. Okay, brother, may God be with you. May God bless you in whatever you need. No gospel shared, no invitation given to accept Yeshua for salvation and for eternal life. Now, this is the greater work that the Bible says we will be doing. We were all been given this greater work to do, that we are to be Yeshua's mouthpieces for Yeshua's glory. So here they are walking around Israel, lost, without a shepherd. And Yeshua is feeding this uh, compassion on them. So um, go to the next one, please. So in Mark verse 7, he called out unto him the 12. It says in Mark's uh, passage, can you press it over time? We have the mission that he's going to send them out in the next one. It says in verse 7, and he called unto him the 12. And began to send them forth two by two. So in Mark's account, they are to go out in pairs. So this would be a ministry or a co-ministry of mutual encouragement. Sometimes if you go out by yourself, street witnessing or whatever, sometimes you know people can gather up and get many people around and sometimes it becomes uncomfortable. But if you have two and you go out, what can encourage you to the ministry? What's going on if you uh, feel down? But it's always a mutual encouragement. Now, how many of you know what Barnabas means? His name? Encouragement. Yes, yeah, son of encouragement, Barnabas. Son of encouragement. So he was Paul's um, companion during Paul's first um, early ministry. So the partners were there to encourage one another. It also means son of consolation. Sometimes, you know, in a missionary, you have personal loss and you can console one another. Or if someone yells at you, his name is also son of comfort. So sometimes th things definitely get rough in the trenches. Like if someone yells at you or berates you, but there is always someone there to comfort you. Secondly, in verse 2, the mission is of uh, Luke, it says, and he sent them to preach the kingdom. So this is where Dr. Frutenbaum really separates himself from other scholars in his ability to give the best details pertinent to the text from Yeshua's Jewish perspective, okay? So how many people could answer this question correctly? What kingdom of God is this that they will be proclaiming? Anybody know? Is it the Messianic Kingdom? No, they rejected that. They rejected the Messianic Kingdom. Remember we talked about the Mystery Kingdom. When did the Mystery Kingdom come into play? On the same day that he was rejected. On the same day that he was rejected, he taught in parables, it says. And his parables, his nine parables, talked about this new Mystery Kingdom. And this Mystery Kingdom will be in place until the messianic kingdom is installed. Now the church is part of it, but it's not the whole of it. The church will end at the rapture while the mystery kingdom will end at the inception of the messianic kingdom. So again, this mystery kingdom began 
at the rejection of the Messiah. So how will then this messianic kingdom that was rejected by the Jews, how will this messianic kingdom be set up now that he's been rejected? The way it's going to be set up is those who rejected him, the Jewish religious leaders will have to call upon Yeshua to save them. So they must correct this one transgression, which the Bible talks about in the prophets. The one transgression that they did was they rejected the Messiah on the basis of demon possession. So the disciples are still trying to, at this point, comprehend this new facet of God's kingdom program. They will more likely be dealing or thinking in their minds about the messianic kingdom, but we're actually in the mystery kingdom still yet. So you remember back in uh, verse 35 of Matthew, it says that the gospel, the gospel was preached. So this is a different gospel from a person. So the gospel then is different than the gospel that we have today. What was the gospel today that people are saved? In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, that we believe that Yeshua died, was buried, and rose again on the third day. He died for our sins. It showed the substitutionary uh, efficacy of his death. And he was buried to show in reality that he was dead and he died. And then rose again on the third day. So after preaching this tour of the twelve, later on, later on in paragraph 83 is when Yeshua tells them that he is going to be killed. And Peter took him aside, you remember? He took him aside and rebuked him saying, that will never happen. So if the gospel was the same throughout the ages, then Peter would have no business rebuking him because he would say, no, oh yeah, you better, you gotta die. But it never was like that. How many of you heard this old cliche? The church looked back to the, back to the cross and the Jews looked forward to the cross. Have you heard that cliche? Yep. Is that true though? No. Because if it was, Peter would have been on board. Yeah, you gotta die, you're right. But Peter and everybody else was against it. So what it shows is that cliche is really not correct in, in all of its makeup. So what this implies is that salvation is always the same from the beginning. It's always by faith through grace, but the content changes the content changes so going back to matthew 1 what does it say in matthew 10 1 it says and when he had called unto him his 12 disciples remember that now he called unto him his 12 disciples he gave them gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. So we can see that demons do not cause all of the sicknesses, all of the diseases. Okay? Sometimes it's because of sin. What is the difference between a disease or a sickness? We know demon possession, right? You demon possess, you demon possess. What is a disease? I looked it up. A disease is something that an organ in your body has. That's what a disease is. And it's a definite morbid process, often with a characteristic train of symptoms. So they have, oh, you must have this because these symptoms are what this disease is. What is a sickness? A sickness is something that a man has. So a disease is something that needs to be cured, like an infection, toxicity or a cell degeneration while a sickness is something that needs to be managed such as a feeling of pain discomfort distress weakness fatigue so this is a condition marked by a pronounced it says deviation from your normal healthy state okay so these are two things that are not mutually exclusive to one another. They often occur together. So a disease usually comes, causes sickness, okay? So if you have a disease, somewhere in your body is going to hurt. 
but it can exist without feeling, without any feeling of sickness. So for example, some people have heart disease and they don't know it until they actually get a heart attack and die. No symptoms, they just die. In the same way, we have sickness without disease. For example, often pain occurs to a person, you go to the doctor, they don't know where the, what the problem is. So there's a pain that is close to a man. Now in Matthew verses 2 to, two to 4, we have the names of all the 12 uh, apostles, it says there. That we had actually discussed back in chapter 53, paragraph 53. So did you notice in verse 1 of Matthew's account, it says he had called upon his 12 disciples. In verse 2, you notice, now the names of the 12 apostles are these. What happened? Why the change from disciples to apostles? These learners were now sent out. When you're sent out, the Greek, the Greek word is apostolos, apostolone. Those who are sent out from amongst the disciples, the mathete. The disciples were all together, but these particular ones were sent out, direct, sent out by Yeshua. So again, disciples are learners. Apostles are sent out ones from amongst the disciples. So at this time, the apostles and the apostle legates, those who work with the apostles, was given this power. It was um, intrinsic just for these people. So we also notice in verse 4, he goes through all of the disciples, and in verse 4 it says, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, Judas the man from Cariot. He's among the people getting this charge, given this power to heal all manner of sickness and to cast out unclean spirits. This very one, he received the authority to heal, cast out demons. Isn't it hard to understand or hard to fathom? How could this one man have turned from Yeshua? After seeing Yeshua's power and might and all the works that he had done, how could he turn away? What gave him the impetus to turn away? Was it money? I think he threw back the money, right? How much was that he threw back? It was 30 pieces of silver. You know what that bought? A dead slave. So if you killed someone's slave, 30 pieces of silver. So that's what they thought of Yeshua, a dead slave. Was it that? Was it worldliness? Was it pride? Will Judas make the headline news becoming famous for writing out the Messiah or the so-called Messiah? They said when he did all these things, Satan had entered him. Now you remember the, the parable about the wheat and the tares? They grew up together. They see the same things, but one actually becomes a true disciple. And one is able to be a false looking like the real. But in the end, as you shake out everything, they're false. They're tears. So next, two on your... Uh, you go to the next. So this one goes from Matthew 5 um, to 15. And Jesus gives them practical instructions for the mission that they are sent out to do. And he had pointed out five specific things. So number one, we'll read in verses five and six. The twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go into the way of the go not, excuse me, go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter you not. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Are the tribes of Israel part of the house of Israel? So are they lost? They're lost physically, not... No, they're lost spiritually, not physically. You can find them all in Israel. People say that they're a lost tribe. There's no lost tribes. They know where they are. So what is the charge here that they should do? They are not to go into the homes of Gentiles or non-Jews. 
They're also not to go into the homes of Samaritans. What are Samaritans? They're Hapa. They're half Jew, half Gentile. So Yeshua instructs the apostles to go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So in this context, the tribe of Israel, again, they're not physically lost. They're spiritually lost. Spiritually lost. But only the remnant, the true Israel of God, will be saved. So for their mission that they were sent out on was a limited scope for this work. Was to do only in the homes of Jewish people. So this is a very good example that not all of Yeshua's commands are applicable for all time. This is the only, this is only for apostles during this specific period of time okay can god do that today perhaps but this particular charge was for them in this particular time can our god do it if we pray yeah i don't see why not still the same god the second thing about this instruction is the nature of their work would have two different facets the first facet is their message which is the kingdom verse 7 and it says and ye go preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand so they are again to preach the kingdom and whatever they understand of the kingdom program at this time which is they kind of know most of the mess messianic kingdom but they have to come to the realization that they're in the mystery kingdom but since their message is largely limited to the believing remnant, they'll be able to tell the remnant that the messianic kingdom is still very much part of Yeshua's or God's kingdom program. Even though the apostles themselves do not realize that the messianic kingdom will not be established at this time, at this point in time. So a lot of them think that Yeshua is gonna overtake everybody, but he's not. He came as the suffering servant. Yeshua ben Yosef, the son of Joseph, and then he will come back as the Lion of Judah. The second facet is that they would be they would authenticate their message by means of miracles. It says in verse eight, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, and freely you give. So what, what must go on here? They are to share everything that they've learned and they have to give this freely because freely they have received it and freely they must go and do it. Same with us. We receive the gift of the gospel for free. And when we share the gospel, for free. So in verse nine, he tells them not to take a number of things. It says, in verse 9 of uh, Matthew, provide neither gold nor silver, nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey, neither two coats. He just goes on. One will be enough. Do not take shoes, right? Neither shoes nor stays, for the workman is worthy of his meat. Do not take shoes nor staff, because the principle is the labor is worthy of his food so they're to go out their needs are going to be met by adonai so they must learn to trust in him i mean to really trust in him go out with nothing god's going to take care of you do you believe that so it is not intended to be followed by believers for all time but this is what they had to do at this time because later on in the Gospels, you're going to see, he's going to say, take gold, take this, take all of these things. But at this particular juncture in the ministry, they are not to take these things. So the very things he tells them not to bring down, he will tell them to take later. So there are certain um, discrepancies that need to be clarified. Again, the critics are quick to show apparent contradictions. Can you go to the next one? So it says, uh, next one, Kari. The first one is sandals. Next one, Kari. So in verse uh, 10 of Matthew, it says, 
no bag for your journey, no tunics, no sandals. And in, um, next one. In Mark's account, it says, but wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And so I go one more. So the Greek in Matthew 10.10 10 is hupo demo, it's, a, it's above the skin or over the skin, meaning shoes. Next one, Scarlett. They also a Greek word is sandalion, which means sandals. Kind of the same thing. But you can, uh, if your shoe breaks, you can make it into a sandal. <laughs> and I know we have a Chinese friend that his shoe breaks, his slipper breaks, he fixes everything. Duct tape, anybody. He saved everything. So that's, that's what can happen. Go to the next one, Carly. The second discrepancy these people bring up is the staff. Okay. So in one it says, nor a staff, don't bring a staff in Matthew's account. It says, except the staff, you bring a staff. And the next one is no staff. So no, bring a, no staff, no staff, except the staff. So there's a different Greek word for these ones. Go on, Cardi. Rabdon, and it is rabdon and monon, which only, except, monon is, means except or only. And Luke 9 is rabdon. Okay, you go to the next one. So all of those is stick one scepter staff. So what he's really saying here, don't buy or acquire additional things. Go with what you have now. What a guy, he had his staff. Yeah, go with your staff, take your staff. Another guy didn't have a staff. So don't prepare anything for this mission. Go out with what you have now and trust in me, I will pull you through, I will take care of you. So now in verse, or um, well, the King James is staves, staff, or staves. They all mean the same thing. A scepter. Okay. You got next one, Kai? So in verse um, 11 to 13, we have the fourth point regarding the, these instructions given. The focus here is on the worthy, meaning the believers. The individual and not the masses. It says, And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who is in it. It is worthy. And abide till you go there. And when you come into the house, salute it. What does that mean? So here he isn't dealing with the masses. They're going into individual homes, seeing who is worthy of Yeshua. So they are looking for the members of the remnant. In every time, in every moment in biblical history, there was always a remnant. Remember Eliyahu, Elijah thought he was the only remnant? And then, oh no, there's thousands, man. It's not just you. There's always a remnant. Even today, there will be a remnant. Today, we're in the Laodicean church period where majority of the churches has some type of corrupted uh, doctrine. That's true, that's what the Bible teaches. Majority of the churches has some type of doctrinal corruption. That's why we're in the Laodicean. He says, you're rich, you think you're rich, but you're poor. Come to me and buy this song so you can see, because you're so rich that you can't see beyond your wealth. So in verse 12 it says, and when you come into the house, salute it. What does that mean? Give it your apostolic blessings. He goes on and says in verse 13, And the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. How's that? Yeah, like, suck it back in. So if the house people were worthy, meaning the people were true believers, then you leave that blessing of peace, that shalom that you put upon them. But if it proved to be not what, it, what they claimed to be, pull it back. Withdraw the peace from that house. Again, the focus is on an individual household or a family situation. The fifth point, last thing here, concerns the unworthy. And you don't want to be the unworthy. And he points out in verse 14, And whoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of the house, city, or city, shake off your dust off of your feet. So this applies not just to the house that is not worthy, but it also applies to the city which the house resides. 
it then becomes unworthy. In verse 15, he wraps it up. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for the city. What does that mean? We notice how the judgment moves from an individual to the greater scale implying the city and it goes into a national judgment. So verse 50, we can see that there will be different degrees of punishment in the final judgment of unbelievers. So even in hell, there'll be different degrees of judgment. And then when you're thrown into the lake of fire, same thing. Point three, we almost did. It deals with instructions in view of the coming persecution. So verse 16 says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. So in wisdom, be smart, be, be street smart, be like the serpent, but in actions, show your humility because they're going to be <laughs> a sheep in the midst of wolves. We were just watching the documentaries the other week about how these gators and all kinds of animals come in and they attack the sheep. And one of them was wolves. So they must use wisdom in dealing with the cunningness of the world. So verse 17 and 18 goes on and says, But be aware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils, and in their synagogues they will scourge you. Yes, and before governors and kings you shall be brought for my sake for a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. See, it wasn't to the Jews, it was to the Gentiles. But be aware. I mean, this is coming upon the church today as a whole. But back then it was specifically for the apostles who were sent out. They're going to deliver you up to these councils. And even for us with those tracking, COVID trackers, they can turn us in, do things just um, against believers. The third thing in 19, it says, But when, you deliver, when they deliver you up, be not anxious how or what you shall speak. For it shall be given to you in that hour when you shall speak. For it is not you that speak, but the Spirit of your Father that speaks to you. So these apostles will be thrown into jail, don't know what to say, but the Lord will give them these words. And this was for these people for this time. But I think even today, if we're taken this way, I think the Lord will also give us these words. And in verse 21 through 23, we see the scope of this persecution is pretty terrible. And we're going to notice how it, this also grows in intensity. Verse 21 says, And brothers shall deliver, deliver a brother to death, and that was what was occurring, and the father his child, and children shall rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Very much turmoil in the land of Israel during this time when Yeshua was on board and when he was rejected. Talk about a schisms. Talk about, you know, Republicans and Democrats, like, full on after each other. Just that division. So the family will hate you. Verse 22 says, And ye shall be hated of all men for my sake. But he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. So the end of this ministry, this particular ministry, you can be saved. Verse 23, but when they persecute you in this city, so it went from your family to the wider all men, but when they persecute you in this city, so as they're teaching from city to city, if they're accepted, they leave their peace. If they're rejected, they have to leave and put the curse on them, put the mojo on that city, and they must flee to the next city. So they're doing all these things. If they accept it, hallelujah. If they're rejected, run. For verily I say unto you, you shall not, you shall not have gone though through the cities of Israel to the Son of Man be come. Now this does sound like a second coming type of thing, but in this context, we can see that Yeshua is saying, upon my triumphant entry, when I'll be lifted up and be looked at as the Lamb, you would have not have reached all of the cities. 
So your, your work will not be complete. It will be incomplete. But they could perhaps complete it after he dies. So he would not be uh, ready there. Point four. He warns them to expect to be rejected <laughs> the same way that he was rejected on the basis of demon possession, okay? Anybody tell you you guys was demon possessed? <laughs> I will tell you the truth. When I came, when I came to the Lord, my mom told me I was sick. <laughs> so you know, after studying this, I said, "Yeah, hey, Yeshua said I'll be with you, <laughs> following sick, Yeah, they would charge that to me. So verse twenty-four says, "A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his Lord." That is. Perfectly true. That is a true statement. And he goes on to say, It is enough for the disciple that he be as his teacher and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more them of his household? So he's saying, I was called demon possessed. I was rejected on that account. But <laughs> because you are mine, that's going to happen to you. That's a uh, common uh, rabbinic logic. It's called, it's called the Homer. When you go from the light or the easy to the hard. It's easy to believe that Yeshua was called Beelzebub. But you will call us Beelzebub. That's a little harder to accept. But that's what exactly happened. So verse 26. Fear them not therefore. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. But I tell you in darkness, speak ye in the light, and what ye hear in the ear, proclaim upon the housetop. So proclaim the message in spite of knowing that you're going to get persecuted. No hide. Don't cower. Go out there and be both for his account. Now in verse 28 to 31, there are called not to fear men, but God. Listen to this. It says, and be not afraid of them that kill the body. That's easy. But are not able to kill the soul. Oh. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. That's pretty heavy. I mean, why are you going to be scared of man? He can only kill your body. Be scared of God who can show you where your spirit is going in the end. Fear him. So verse 29 says, And are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them shall fall on the ground without your father? So he knows it all. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. Ye are more value than many sparrows. Now this was one of the, even though I didn't fully understand it, but when I came to Yeshua, how many years ago was that? 20 something years. This one, this passage really spoke to me. That he, you know, he cares for the doves and everything, but how much more he cares for us. And I saw that this love is so great and so awesome. So God is the one who cares. He is in control. And whatever bad things will happen, will happen within his will. So verse 32 and 33. It says, Everyone therefore who shall confess me before men, he will I also confess, confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, he will I also deny before my Father who is in heaven. How many of you heard this passage used in the correct context of the apostles at this time? No one. In the correct context? Because we always use this, oh, you got to come up to the front of the podium and Accept Jesus because you don't accept him before me. You don't confess him, then he's not going to confess you. It sounds good, but it's not in context with that, with this uh, ministry that the apostles have. I guess you could use it, but to me, if you're going to use it in a different way, at least know the actual context. And once you get the actual context, then you can expand into application. But until you do, keep it in context. 
Det vil være sådan. So verse 34 through 36, Yeshua will point out he will become the new point of division in the Jewish homes. Okay, going to be Yeshua is the one bringing up division. He says, think not that I came to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. For I came to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and the man's foes shall be they of his own household. This is true for Jewish families from Yeshua's day all the way until today. If a Jew comes to believe in Yeshua, the parents actually make a writ of death. They actually put them in the obituaries of a little funeral. And it still happens today. But this was for them at that time. There is a wider context that you can be used. Verse 37 says, He that loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that doth not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. What does that mean? The individual believer must make full commitment to become a disciple. And to be a true disciple means if that they are to choose between the Messiah and the family who, who ought to they choose? The Messiah. That is the main thing. It's between you and your wife. Your wife doesn't want to follow along. You got to separate and become with the Messiah. Your kids rejecting Messiah. You will love them, but you got to show allegiance to Messiah and woo them back into the fold. And what does it mean to take up the cross? It means fully identifying yourself with that rejection. You can get rejected, you gotta say yes. They rejected me because they rejected my Messiah. And I will take up that mantle, I'll take up that cross and die to myself. Okay, next one. And he says in verse 39, He that finds his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. So the context again is to the apostles in that ministry then. But I find an application for us today. If we find our own life, if we do our own thing, our life is wasted and lost. But if we lose our life in Yeshua, that's where we're gonna find life. That's where we're gonna find an abundance in life. Okay, let's go quickly to the last two. So the rewards for individuals who accept, it says, He that receives you receives me, and he that receives me receives him that sent me. He that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. So we, we are getting, um, we're going to get rewards for serving Yeshua. But, He's going to give you rewards as we work out, as we share, and as we understand who Messiah is, we're going to get rewards for the work that we do. And in verse 42 it says, Whoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only, in the name of a disciple, will verily I say, he shall in no wise lose his reward. So what it means here, any work, any work that you do for Messiah, anything that you do for him, you will be noticed and you will get a reward. If you serve in the preschool, if you serve anywhere, picking up rubbish, anything that you do for Messiah, you will gain a reward. How awesome is that, right? Our rubbish lives, it gives us a reward. Last one. The last point is the fulfillment. And it says, And it came to pass when Yeshua had finished commanding his twelve disciples, he departed there to teach and preach in their cities. And they went out in Mark's account and preached that men should repent. And they cast out devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. Selah. Beautiful. He gives out the whole mission plan, the work they ought to do, what's going to happen, and in the end, they fulfill it in many ways before he goes to the cross. So our God is very detailed in the things that he, he's asked us to do. 
and the things that he's asked us to do he has already done himself so it's not like you, you go grab the alligator or you grab that python i ain't grabbing it i grabbed it before like it's all about he did it let's uh, respond to what he did because he is the best witness for us let us pray Abba, we see how lovely your uh, your word just uh, manifests itself and how beautiful it is and all the great details Lord, that you've given the apostles of that day what a time mass confusion in the land they don't know who is their shepherd fathers killing their sons the attorney it's just radical but Yeshua said just take up the cross be ready for what's going to happen I am faithful trust in me so Lord as we prepare our hearts to receive the bread and the cup let us be mindful of your great love so great a love Lord. and while we were yet your enemies you died for us oh so awesome so Lord, we love you and we praise you in Yeshua's name and we say, Amen. Amen. It is Yeshua's blood that cleanses us. things that we do and we say that it might bring uh, glory to you Lord. I'd like to pray for the food if, before we get out there I said you bless it and I would like to bless the people
Gracious unto thee, the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. So, what's your love? Aloha. Let's go outside and have a community.